Cecile Blulius. Today's guest is the head of impact and sustainability for Israel's largest venture fund, Patango Venture Capital. She's been active in impact investing for years. She joined Patango three years ago to help develop its impact practice. She'll share insights about her work and her superpower. I'm your host, Devin Thorpe. Welcome to the Superpowers for Good show, where we empower you. Cecile, thank you so much for letting me be here in your home in Tel Aviv. It's such a joy to be here with you, uh, and it's so great to have you back on the show. Thank you very much. Well, Devin, thank you, first of all, for coming all the way here and for helping with the cooking. <laughs> yeah. The dinner is not going to be ready without you. <laughs> I did the tiniest little part. Thank you for allowing me to help. I feel just a little bit better about uh, being, eating your dinner. Um, you do some amazing work. You know, I, we, we've known each other for a long time, and I'm so glad. I uh, count you as a great friend. Um, but one of the things, you, since you were last on the show, you've got a great new job uh, with the largest venture capital fund in, in Israel. Tell us a little bit about your work at Patango. Sure. So first of all, it's really a privilege to be on the show again and to be your friend <laughs> because I do follow you and I think um, even people that do things all day long to try to make this world a better place, they still need a lot of inspiration. They still need to, be, to feel that they're not alone and that other people do care about what they do and what they think and it's also a good way to breathe for a moment and like get your breath, you know what I mean? So thanks. Well, thank that. you. Thank you. So tell us about your okay. work at Pitango. So Pitango. Pitango is basically um, celebrating its 30th year this year. It's Israel's largest venture capital fund. It was founded by Chemi Peres, the son of our late president Shimon Peres, and uh, Rami Kalish and a few other partners. Um, it, we're at our Fund 11 by now, uh, raised about $3 billion, invested most of it in Israeli startups. And um, very much as a generalist fund. So Pitango mm -hmm. works as a platform. We work out of three parallel funds. One is an early stage fund that invests very early to round A. Then the um, uh, growth fund, which invests further than that and all the way to the IPO or exit. And a third fund that focuses on health tech. Health tech meaning also food, anything to do with human health. Okay. Um, and those <clears throat> funds work as a platform in parallel, even though the partners, uh, the, the, the founding partners are still involved in all the funds, but they each have their own team. Um, and they, I have to say that the DNA of the founders of Pitango is such that forever, since they, they uh, started, they never invested in anything harmful or anything that could be perceived as something that might create any harm. Mm -hmm. uh, not out of any policy or any, I don't know, decision or any strategy, but really as part of their DNA, which made them the best candidate for me to join. Um, so um, since we met, uh, I founded uh, and managed Impact First Investments, which was actually Israel's first impact investing company that invested mm -hmm. in early stage startups that were tech and impact. Mm -hmm. And uh, at some point, I went to Pitango that I knew because I had founded something else with them in the past, like another fund that invested in Arab entrepreneurs, which was, okay. again, the first one in Israel. Yeah. And because I knew with of that... With Fadi, right? No, that, I, oh, no, Fadi came much He came later, later. Yeah. But, it, but it was Taquin. It, it was, no, no, it wasn't Taquin. It was oh. Alba Wadel. It was a fund oh, okay. that was even way before. It was really the first fund that invested in Israeli um, uh, Arabs that, uh, you know, who knew you could invest in uh, Arab entrepreneurs. That yeah. was uh, the paradigm. So we really made a paradigm shift, and, and Pitango managed that fund. Um, and so I knew what the, who these people were. And I came to them and I said, look, you're not making any impact in your investing. Why? I mean, you're also investing in early stage. Why not? And they very candidly said, you know, we don't know if this makes any money. Uh, nobody's really proven the connection between making an impact and making profits. And, you know, it's 2014 at that point. Uh, we are accountable for our LPs. Our job is to maximize profits. We really can't do this, but we understand why it's necessary. So we'll support Impact First out of our own capital and help you with whatever you need to make this work. And that's exactly what they did. So what happened was that I was already embedded in their office, kind of a Trojan horse, uh -huh. if you will. 
And um, I knew that these people really looked at impact in a much wider lens than just normal people who don't deal with impact and, and right, tech. Right. And then when in late 2019, they came over and said, okay, you know what? We get it. And by now, the world is talking about ESG, about the sustainable development goals, about impact and all these things. We think that even as a generalist fund that invests across the board in cybersecurity and DevOps and quantum computing and mobility and, and whatnot, we still think that we have to think about our impact on the world. How can we bring your world and our world together? And would you lead it? So I joined Pitango three years ago with the idea to bring the, the paradigm of ESG impact, just doing the right thing for businesses mm -hmm. um, into mainstream VC. And I looked left and right and I said, okay, can I maybe learn from others who've done this before and I couldn't find anyone, which is, you know, to me, not, not a big deal. And I said, okay, then I'm going to have to build a strategy that is a good fit for venture capital, that is mainstream, not necessarily investing only in impact, given that the DNA of these people is already there in terms of avoiding harm and never actually really investing in anything harmful. And how can we build a strategy that really will take this whole holistic approach of ESG, of impact, of the sustainable development goals, and just thinking about climate, you know, yeah. issues that we care about, into making really, really great businesses and support that thesis with financial results. Uh, so I built this strategy that I call the uh, ESG to SDG continuum. Because it, it really is a continuum. Looking at the whole picture, all companies have to have good ESG standards because it's the right thing to do, because it's the best way to manage your business, because if you have diversity in your team, you'll have better ideas, better uh, solution solve, uh, pro uh, solutions mm -hmm. to, to problems. You'll have uh, just more opportunities. You'll have the best talent. If you think about your carbon emissions as part of your DNA in your, in your corporate, then you will also make sure that you harm the planet less, but you also attract the best employees and your um, clients will also be happy about what you do. So, so ESG is like the bare minimum that everybody should do. Right, right. And if you can add to that the impact lens, then let's do that. Yeah. We won't force it on anyone who doesn't have it, which in Pitango's case, again, because of our DNA, would be around 30% of the companies, you know, just the backbone of the internet, the, you know, making uh, wireless uh, faster, things that yeah. don't have an impact. But 70% of the companies actually do have an impact. And that's where we add the impact lens. Yeah, so, the, so oftentimes those companies were coming, attract, getting capital at Patango, and, and no one in the process before you was saying, let's look at the impact of this on the underserved community or on health or whatever else as an impact and leaning into that. How do you, once you come on the scene and you see that impact is there, how do you begin to get the energy behind that in terms of doing things like measuring the impact, uh, expanding it, amplifying it, you know, doing the kinds of things that impact-oriented entrepreneurs and investors are already thinking about how do you bring maybe the reluctant entrepreneur with a whole set of investors who didn't invest for that impact? How do you bring them along? So my world is divided between two types. One is the impact natives. They were born out of impact. They don't need to be coached into understanding what is their impact. They actually yeah. can identify the global challenge that they're trying to address and they're uh, on it. They do need uh, help with methodology, with the um, measurement piece. They need to understand exactly what they're doing and they need a lot of help around ESG, by the way, because um, in my career, I've seen that impact entrepreneurs sometimes just totally forget about the fact that you actually have to build just a good corporate that has good ESG standards. So yeah. that needs to be added. And then you have the impact migrants. And these migrants are people who can be investors, it can be entrepreneurs, it can be people who work for companies, it can be just anyone, who once you expose them to the fact that you can actually build into your business case the impact that your product will do, make sure that you intentionally create it, track it and measure it, then you add 
a really big component to your business that you might not have thought of, or you maybe you thought about it, but you didn't think it was part of your business, or in business school, they taught you that you shouldn't blend business and impact, so you shouldn't be talking about it, but it's really inside, it's there, but you don't know what to do about it. And then you migrate them to actually implementing that. And that, so I designed this process called, I call impact migration, and I just take them through it. I coach the companies through it. I try to identify what was it that they were thinking when they were building their company and their product. What was the problem they were thinking about? And then I pitch to them what their, pro- their company does through my lens. Right. And that's when you see this aha moment. It's happened to me many times. When I speak to an entrepreneur, I said, okay, let me pitch you your company uh-huh. through my lens. And they discover that actually by not referring to it, they are losing on potential business, on potential growth engines, on um, revenues that they could be charging that they're not doing, yeah. even with things that they're already doing anyway, but are not framed in that way. So it's never, ever going to be about something that doesn't exist. If the impact is not there, it's not there. I'm not going to try to invent it. There's no right. impact washing here. Yeah. But for the ones who actually do, it's quite impressive what you can do with it. I can give you an example of a company please, you might please. know. Yeah, yeah. So we have one of our larger companies in our portfolio is a company called Via. Via is a, is a shared mobility startup. Okay. What it, it does is a software that helps you get from point A to point B in the most convenient way with sharing rides. Mm-hmm. So it's not like Uber where you order a car that picks you up and drops you off, mm-hmm. but instead you order sort of a car, but it's a car that is communal, so other people are in the car, and while the, the, you are ordering it online and all the rest of the people do the same, the uh, system is uh, doing the dynamic routing for the driver to pick you up and drop you off as close as possible to where you are. So when the founders thought about VIA, they were thinking about how to make public transportation more efficient, with less buses that yeah. run around mostly half empty most of the day, yeah. uh, certainly the last mile in, inside city centers where you have all these buses that are just on schedule, but nobody really needs them, and yeah. it's certainly not their size. Um, they're, they're polluting. Uh, people, make the, they're uncomfortable, so they use their car anyway. Yeah. So what if they could reduce the number of people that uh, are single riders in cars? and could actually share rides and get to point A to point B, not necessarily through the route of the existing bus route, but actually an invented route that was invented as on the spot. On the spot, yeah. uh, By the the algorithm. Yeah. And they were thinking about the reduction of carbon emissions because they were thinking about, uh, you know, less buses Mm -hmm. on the the roads and, you know, this this whole um, better way to design and execute on public transportation, which is true. But then we started working on their impact migration. And what we found out was actually that the social impact that this company has is even way bigger. Because what VIA really is about is providing accessible and affordable transportation for anyone, anywhere. So if you think about it, let's say that you live somewhere outside of the city center. And in order to get to uh, where the jobs are or where the education is or where healthcare is available, you need to take... two different or three different buses and it'll take you an hour and a half. Yeah. In comes VIA and within a half hour, it'll get you to where you need to go with this one ride that is yeah. both affordable and accessible. Yeah. So then they started looking at the accessibility of the VIA services. Yeah. Accessibility for people with special needs who can't really use public transportation yeah. the, the way it's designed or people that are in transportation deserts that don't have access to good public transportation yeah. or people who need to go to long, uh, long distance um, like train stations or bus stations but they need this last mile so instead of taking their yeah. car there they can actually just take yeah. via. It, it allows for people to operate without a car. Exactly. Right? Uh, and and Uber does that, but this is sounds like it could be potentially a cheaper, more affordable option. Oh yes, and they have you, you basically have full cars. So these are minibuses. Yeah. So Via actually sells yeah. the software to the local transportation company. So your local transportation company might be using Via like transportation uh-huh. as a service, yeah. and and actually giving you an app which is your local branded app 
that you go in, you, you pick up where you are, where you want to go, and on the way, they will pick up other people and let go of other people yeah. based on the dynamic routing that is done on the spot. So VIA had in mind an impact that was all environmental, and you helped them see a whole social impact that was additional that is bringing, and, and of course, really broadened their perspective about exactly. what, what they were doing and the impact they were having. That's brilliant. So I think that the company is brilliant. And, yeah. and, you know, one thing that um, we used to show what social mobility looks like, they show a map of where a person could get to in 30 minutes of public transportation be before VIA and after VIA. Oh, yeah. And then they added to that map all the, the jobs, the, the hospitals, the education system, all these yeah. the parks, malls, and that's what what uh, social mobility looks like when you create affordable solutions for people to get to where they need to, be, to go yeah. in a way that is affordable but also efficient. Yeah. Well, in this day and age, a lot of good jobs are in a suburb, but it may not be the suburb where you live. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the transit structures in many big cities is designed to get people downtown. So that means if you're working in a different suburb, it's come downtown, and then go back out to the other suburb and then reverse the trip when yes. you get off your shift. Um, and of course, depending on your shift, that may, there may not be any more buses. That's that's right. all kind of, this VIA thing really is a, an exciting innovation. Oh, that's yes. fun. Yes. I, I so, should have been familiar with it, but I wasn't. I'm glad you shared. I think it's, uh, you should really look at yeah. it as... I, it, I invented that in my head, uh, by the way, a few the world. years ago. It's yeah. operating all around yeah. the world, and certainly in the U.S. And the, the nice thing about it is that we really didn't change anything about the model or the product. Right. We just added a layer that wasn't there before. I mean, it was there, but it was uncovered. And we yeah. uncovered it and allowed the company to capitalize it on it and understand what it is and use that as part of their, their sales pitch. Because yeah. at the end of the day, the customers, the cities, the local right. governments, they're interested in creating... Uh, you know, better access to, to mobility without That's uh, the key adding pain. more more cars to the roads. Yeah. In a way that serves everyone in the best in the best yeah. way and gets people to jobs. That's the pain the people at the at the uh, transit company feel. Right? Is the customer pain, the user experience that they don't really have pain from the environment, and so they're not. Well, I think that's coming They're measuring to, it, right? Yeah, they're measuring it, they're to, tracking it, yes. but that's not real pain. In well, the I, same sense, they're is, having someone that's, call that's up and say... That's very tangible. If you, look, yeah. if you think about the social mobility, that's a tangible issue. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, amazing story. Great example. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you you've had a really a, a remarkable career. You've done some great things. We've talked only about a few of the tremendous impacts you've had. But uh, what is your superpower? Well, I don't really think it's a superpower because I think most people have it. Um, <laughs> okay. Maybe we need to migrate people <laughs> into exercising it, but I do think that grit might be it. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to think different than other people, and it's hard to be convinced that you're right or that you're on the right track, even though people tell you that you're wrong and this cannot be done and it hasn't been done before and that's not how yeah. you teach it or whatever. Um, you end up banging your head against the wall a lot. Uh, yeah. And so if you're not very strong-willed and you don't have this perseverance, I think that's mm -hmm. grit, right? The, yeah. the ability to stick to something that you believe is true and just keep going and keep doing it even though most times it's hard because people either don't buy into it, they don't believe you, or they think that you're crazy or that you're moving too fast. So the, the ability to achieve things, I think, has been very much um, attributed to the fact that I have that, that superpower, if you will, but I think really yeah. a lot of people have it. But with that, um, I move fast. It's frustrating because most of the world doesn't move as fast, and that's uh, sometimes very frustrating. Uh, but I take opportunities, and that's also something that people should be more aware of because opportunities come along all the time, and we just seem to not pay attention. So we have to pay attention to opportunities, and when they come, we take them. Yeah. And sometimes we're wrong. I mean, I fail a lot. 
Yeah. But I'm also right sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> and when I when I am, I get this grit going, and that gets me where I go. Let, let's <clears throat> lean into that just a little bit. So you mentioned that sometimes you're wrong. We're all wrong. Most we all have failures. But uh, sometimes you're right. Let's 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 explore an example. Share an example of when you were right, but grit was the key for making it work. So when I started with Impact First Investments, I was absolutely sure that everyone would just realize that blending capital with tech to create solutions for our world's biggest problems just made sense. Yeah. And it just, till now, it's like absolutely mind-boggling to me that I was among the few people who, who really were convinced on that. Yeah. Most people just told me, no, that it can't happen, it's not possible, whatever. Right. Um, so I was right, you know, in retrospect about that being a thing that really works. I was right about uh, making sure that we expand and, and retain as much talent and, as possible into doing these things. But I was wrong with the approach on how to make it happen. Uh, I tried to work it into the mainstream. I tried to build a fund, which didn't work. Uh, I tried to convince people that they should shift their capital into, um, at least some of it, into making that kind of risk. And that, yeah. that was, I was wrong. I was wrong. It's just, it was impossible, for example, to move institutional investors into thinking that they could do something like that. It was yeah. too early for them. No proof, no evidence. I didn't understand their mechanism of why they really couldn't, even if they bought into it they really couldn't yeah. do it and and so sometimes you know i bang my head against the wall because i know i'm right and eventually people will come around and understand it and it will work and that's happened yeah. and sometimes i lose i i realize that this is just a wrong approach and uh and maybe it's too early maybe it's just not the right type of thing that i should be doing and then i refocus and i reconnect with the mission and try to attack it through a different angle yeah um, it seems to me that your point is valid. That you said everyone has this. But at the same time, I think we've all seen moments in our own lives when we fail to demonstrate grit. We fold under pressure. All of us do it at times. Um, and I think some people uh, never sort of actualize their grit. And whether you're on the grit most of the time or grit very few times spectrum, we could all learn more grit, I think. I think it's within our ability to learn more. <clears throat> How would you coach someone to strengthen their grit, to develop more, to be able to endure a little bit more, a little longer, to pull off more successes in their life? I think everyone wants to have more wins. How do we use grit to get there? Well, first of all, you have to accept the fact that you'll fail. And when, when I coach young people, and it happens to me a lot uh, yeah. to, to be in this really formidable and, uh, and flattering position to be able to give some advice to younger people. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to fail and you have to accept it. And when you tell me about your failure, I will support you. Uh, and that's something that is very important. You have to know that you will fail, and when you do, the people around you who love you will still think that you're brilliant, even though you failed. Yeah. Um, so accepting failure is very important, because we all fail a lot. Number two, um, it's hard. I mean, you know, life is hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I raise four children pretty much on my own. <laughs> it's it, it's um, life doesn't give us any candies, not a lot of them to most yeah, of us. Yeah. Um, and you can just decide that it's just too much and you just wish that somebody, someone would take over. But if you do that, then you're, you lose. No one's coming. No, no, yeah. no knight in shiny armor. No one's coming. Yeah. It's up to you. The sooner you understand that, and the sooner you accept that, the better you are. Because then yeah. you face difficulty, you say, okay, this is happening. It's just me here. 
Okay, yeah. I might get some help and retain some people and all that, but at the end of the day, it's me. I, when I go to bed at night, I'm yeah. with me. <laughs> and I look at myself in the mirror, I'm looking at me. So, you know, buckle up yeah. and let's just do it. And sometimes you'll still fail, but a lot of times you'll just get over this bump, which is the hardest, where you, you have like this wish that, okay, could please, can someone just take this away from me and make this work? Not happening. The sooner yeah. you let go of this thought, <laughs> the better adept you are to just get going yeah. and get over the bump. Sometimes you get over the bump and there's nothing there. You have to accept it, done. But yeah. a lot of times, it, beyond the bump is what you're looking for. And there will be more bumps coming in, but sure. you'll be stronger when you, when you yeah. address them. So New skills, bigger just, network. Yeah, it, it's really a matter of strengthening your own core yeah. into trusting yourself that you can do this, get all the help you can get, try to get the mentors you care about, try to get people to, you know, do things with you, for you, use every resource you can. But at yeah. the end of the day, it's about you. And really, you know, buckle up and do it. Yeah, great point, great point. Well, uh, Cecile, thank you so much for taking the time to, to do this with me. And thanks for dinner tonight. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very First of all, it's a pleasure. <laughs> and I really hope that we um, can inspire people to get out of their comfort zone and do things that we all need. Yeah. Um, it's really up to us. So yeah. thank you for doing this. Well, thank you. Thank you. Now, before we wrap up, do you want to take just a minute and tell people how they can learn more about you and your work at Patango and maybe how they can connect on social media or otherwise? Sure. So um, I'm, um, I have a pretty um, busy LinkedIn account, so you can look me up. It's uh, Cecile Blilius at Pitango. It's going to be hard to find someone else with a name like that. So, so <laughs> it's going to be easy to find me. Um, and I do write stuff and I do some podcasts. And So if you Google me, I think you'll find quite a lot of information that, uh, about what I do. Um, if you're a fund or an investor that invests in mainstream VCs that wants to integrate the world of impact and ESG, uh, you're welcome to look at the Pitango website. We have all our strategy in there. Um, I also recommend looking at Venture ESG, which is an, uh, an organization that I'm part of that promotes ESG in mainstream VCs. And I'm really happy to answer any questions and try to get people, you know, everything I write and do is open source. I give it to people with, with joy. So. You know, once you do things, you have to be generous with it. So I try yeah. to do that. To just anyone can can reach out. I really try my best to answer everyone. Well, thank you, thank you, uh, Cecile. I can't thank you enough, uh, and we wish you every success in your great work at Patango. There's so much opportunity for you to change the world there. We really hope you do. Mm, thank you, Devin, and I hope you'll enjoy dinner. <laughs> thank you. I'm <laughs> sure I will. <laughs> now let's do some good. Yes. Thank you for tuning in to the Superpowers for Good show. Twice each week, we host changemakers who share their impact, insights, and superpowers. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today at superpowersforgood.com. That's superpowers, number four, good.com. Be super empowered. Get your copy of the book, Superpowers for Good, as an ebook, audiobook, paperback, or hardcover edition via your favorite online retailer. Interested in having me speak to your company, organization, or association? Visit devonthorpe.com. Then, let's talk. Now, keep using your superpowers for good. Together, we can reverse climate change, improve global health, and eradicate poverty.